their loss, uh, considering this. there's a little bit of a quite a bit of overlap here. Uh, all right, uh, let's get started. Um, so uh, la uh, last Monday we started talking about a uh, fairly uh, somewhat new concept: this idea of uh, transactions. And today we're going to talk about uh, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to start talking about uh, how transactions can basically be uh, combined together uh, in order to produce uh, more efficient uh, execution schedules. Uh, but before I get to that, a uh, couple of things. Uh, first off, uh, weekly, uh, or for your daily reminder, uh, there is a midterm on Monday. Uh, please uh, do not forget, please do not be late. Um, Anticipate questions that will be similar to the homeworks. Uh, speaking of which, I will be posting uh, I'll be posting solutions for homework one for uh, tonight. Um, the midterm will be closed book. Uh, are there any other? Uh, I'll also try and post a couple of uh, sample questions either tonight or tomorrow. Um, hopefully, that should help uh, a few other people. Um, are there any questions? Yes. So it should be uh, everything before the midterm line on the syllabus. Uh, chapters uh, one, uh, so it's not all of chapter, there's a couple of, of sections that I'm not gonna cover on the, the midterm, and those are explicitly noted on the syllabus. Uh, I think chapters, so there's a, a range of chapters, I think around six or seven to, uh, or so that cover applications, application logic and developing applications based on SQL. Um, those will not be on the mid, uh, on the midterm. Uh, we'll be covering through the, the fundamentals, uh, basically chapters one through five, uh, or most of the fundamentals. Uh, I think the only thing I skipped there was relational calculus, um, which will not be on the midterm. Um, chapters, uh, what is it, 9 through 10 or 12 or so on query execution and optimization, and I believe that is actually it. Um, but uh, double check, basically it's everything on the syllabus up to and including uh, optimization. And the syllabus should be updated. Okay, uh, any other questions? <coughs> Great. All right, so let's uh, do a quick recap of what we covered on Monday. Uh, to start off with this idea of transactions. Uh, so in this uh, particular class of workloads that we call OLTP, or Online Transaction Processing, um, the, the sort of distinguishing feature of this particular class of workload is that there are a lot of updates to the data. So you need to be able to access the data uh, as well as change it and make sure that, that those changes uh, leave, the dis leave the data in some sort of uh, consistent state. And the, the fundamental primitive that we're going to use to ensure that the uh, data gets left in a consistent state is a transaction. A transaction is a group of database operations uh, which you can think of as a sequence of reads and writes to various objects in the database. And uh, sort of the, the key guarantee that we're going to try and provide is that uh, as far as the, the entity submitting that transaction, as far as the user is concerned, that transaction gets executed atomically. Um, and that transaction gets either executed, and that means uh, both that it doesn't interact with other transactions executing in the system, uh, and that it uh, preserves uh, the, the data constraints, the integrity constraints that the user is requested on the data. Um, and it should keep those even if the system crashes. So if the system crashes in the middle of executing a transaction, then that transaction should essentially not, uh, should either entirely execute, uh, or it, if it, the system crashes in the middle, uh, the transaction, it should be as if the transaction had never executed in the first place. Uh, 
Um, now I'm going to uh, something that I didn't have enough <coughs> something that I didn't have enough time uh, to include uh, in Monday's lecture. I just want to give you sort of a, a sneak peek at uh, a feature that we'll be covering in quite a bit more detail. Um, the, the sort of process by which we ensure that the uh, that these transactions get executed in their entirety is uh, an algorithm that's commonly known as Aries. Uh, and the basic process, uh, so Aries is an algorithm that allows us to uh, recover uh, from, from crashes. So uh, using this, this sort of log structure, we're going to keep track of every operation that the database does. And this algorithm is, is basically sort of the, the most paranoid algorithm can think of. Uh, it will not only recover from the crash, but it will also, uh, it will not only allow you to recover from the crash, but it will do so in a way that uh, protects you against a crash that occurs during the recovery process. So essentially, the, this, this is going to be uh, sort of the, the fundamental way in which we recover from, uh, from a database crash. Um, I'll get into this a bit, in a bit more detail when we talk about recovery. Uh, probably midway through next week. Okay, um, so getting back to transactions, um, the, the way that we interact with transactions, one of the two things that we want to do with transactions is to ensure that no two transactions interact with one another. And the, the core concept that we're going to use uh, for that, uh, do you have a question? Uh, the core uh, concept that we're going to use for that is something called a schedule. And a schedule is just an order of, of operations. So we have a sequence of operations from multiple transactions, and a schedule is just a way uh, in which we interleave those, those uh, operations. Uh, the, only, the only thing that needs to be uh, in place for a schedule to be legitimate is that the operations in one transaction, execute in that order, in the order that the transaction specifies them. Uh, but any sort of interleaving uh, is, is possible in a schedule. Now, of course, that's a very broad term, a uh, very broad definition. So we want to define uh, what, uh, what it means for a schedule to be correct. And so one particular way of, of representing a correct schedule uh, is by referring to a uh, sort of serial schedule. And a serial schedule is a schedule where there is no interleaving uh, whatsoever. You execute all of one transaction, then you execute all of another transaction. Um, now, there's no uh, sort of uh, constraints on how the transactions are processed with respect to one another. So you can execute transactions one, three, two, or you can execute them two, three, one, pretty much any order. It, uh, as long as the transactions are executed in their entirety. Um, we also can define a notion of equivalence. And we can refer to two schedules as being equivalent if their effect on the database is guaranteed to be equivalent as well. Now, this is a very high level definition. So uh, over the course of the class today, we're going to refine it and, and come up with something that's a little more practical and a little more understandable. Um, so, but that said, we can define uh, what we call a, a serializable schedule as a schedule that is equivalent, that is to say, its final effect on the database is equivalent to some uh, serial schedule. So we can do any sort of reordering as long uh, a serializable schedule, we can uh, do any sort of reordering to get a serializable schedule as long as it, uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the final outcome. Now, one of the nice, uh, in addition to this, this sort of interaction property, uh, the, the sort of correctness guarantee, uh, we also get a nice side effect out of that, uh, in that if the transactions preserve uh, consistency, then the, the that's to say the, uh, the transactions each preserve the integrity constraints on the data, then the serializable schedule is also guaranteed to preserve those constraints. Okay, so now how do we ensure these, these serializable schedules? Well, there are three, three sort of high-level options that we can take. Uh, 
And I mean, there, this is this is not uh, sort of a, a binary thing. There, there's a whole spectrum between each of these. Uh, but sort of at one extreme, we can use uh, locking, so we can uh, protect data that's being modified or accessed, and uh, basically uh, prevent any sort of operation uh, from happening that would lead to a, a schedule not becoming serialized. Um, option number two is to detect when two schedules have become no longer guessed. Uh, can you please uh, go to the previous slide? Uh, I didn't do the difference between a serial schedule and a serial schedule. Ah, okay. So a serial schedule is a schedule in which you execute um, transactions in their, uh, in their entirety in one go. So execute all of the operations for transaction one, all of the operations for transaction two, and so forth. Um, a serializable schedule is one that does allow interleaving, but where, and so we have this, this definition of equivalence. So the, the outcome, uh, two, uh, two schedules are equivalent if their outcomes are identical. Uh, on any database. So regardless of the data that goes into the schedule, there, uh, that goes, regardless of the database when you start off, um, you end up with uh, two schedules are equivalent if they transform the database in the same way. Um, uh, so now a serializable schedule is a schedule that's equivalent to a serial schedule. So a serializable schedule can have interleaving but the outcome has to be uh, the same. The outcome of that transaction has to be the same as some serial schedule. So there, there can be interleaving. It's just not. Um, it, it's. Uh, but the outcome has to be equivalent to executing the transaction. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Oh yes. Sure. T1 writes, T2 writes, T2 writes, T1 
uh, um, but this is still serializable because this is now equivalent to executing all of T2's operations first and then executing all of T1's operations. Uh, so a serializable schedule is, is basically just one that Ah, I think I see the problem. Uh, so I'm not necessarily defining what it means for two, uh, I'm defining what it means for two schedules to be equivalent in a very, very broad sense. Two schedules are equivalent if their outcomes are the same. Um, that is not a practical definition. And one of the things that we're going to talk about over the course of this class is uh, providing more practical definitions so what is it, how, how do you determine, uh, uh, just by looking at the schedules, that two schedules are equivalent? So um, if you still, uh, hold, hold that thought for maybe a little, little bit longer, and if you still have uh, questions towards the end of the class, then um, raise them again. Anything else? All right. Okay, so there, there again, so, sort of from this, this high level, how do you ensure that two schedules end up being serialized? Well, there are uh, three general strategies that you can take. Uh, and again, uh, these, these are not sort of, you don't have to commit to precisely one of them. You can mix and match them in, in various ways. But the, the three general strategies are to use some sort of blocking to make sure that you don't, uh, that you end up with this, with one of these serializable schedules. Um, a second strategy would be to, to detect when two transactions have gotten into some state where um, they would uh, create a sort of non-serializable order, uh, and then abort one of them. And finally, uh, a strategy that's, uh, that's used more and more in, in distributed systems is this idea where you, uh, this, this uh, process where you essentially pre-declare everything that you're going to do. Uh, Declare what values you're going to need to read, and declare what values you're going to need to write, and sort of prepare a schedule before executing. Uh, we'll get into that a bit more uh, when we start talking about distributed systems. Uh, today, we're going to focus mostly on the first two options, using locks and uh, aborting conflicting transactions. So uh, any questions on the recap so far? Okay, so today's lecture is going to be divided into two parts. And the first part is how do we define uh, correctness in a much more uh, precise way? So we have this, this vague, fuzzy notion of equivalence. Uh, how do we make that a little more concrete? We're going to start off with a slightly more uh, concrete definition of equivalence. We're going to call that conflict equivalence. We're going to say that two transactions are conflict equivalent if uh, essentially any sort of conflicting operation between those two transactions has the same order. That is to say, if two transactions modify the same data, they end up. Uh, <coughs> sorry. If, If two operations in a transaction affect the same data object, or modify the same data object, or one of them modifies it, the other accesses it, then all of those operations between the two transactions are ordered in the same way. So in this case, we have a right to A and another right to A. But the transaction 2 came first. Here we have a right to B and a right to B. Transaction 2, once again, comes first. Or, uh, put another way, here's a bit of an example. Uh, so, here we have transaction 2 doing a read on A, which depends on this right to A. And meanwhile, transaction 1 does a read on B, which depends on that right to B. So you can think of this as a, a set of, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, uh, one thing, let me go back. Uh, so this, this notion of conflict equivalence gives us uh, 
some specific way of defining serializability. Um, so we can say that two schedules are conflict serializable if using this definition of equivalence, this, this definition of conflict equivalence, um, if a schedule, a, a schedule is conflict, equi uh, conflict serializable if it is conflict equivalent to some serial schedule. Uh, so let me zoom into that a little bit more. Uh, in this case, we have a dependency. Uh, we have that, those dependencies, one from T2 to, T, uh, to an operation of T1, and one dependency from uh, T1 uh, to an operation of T2. So we can take these, uh, and we can create what we know, what's known as a dependency graph, where we have a node for every single transaction and an edge for each one of these operational dependencies. So in this case, T2 has a read that depends on the output of T1, and T1 has a read that depends on the output of T2. And you can sort of see the problem here. Uh, there is uh, sort of this cyclic dependency between T1 and T2. T1 depends on T2, uh, so T1 can't come first. But T2 depends on T1, so T2 can't come first either. Uh, Essentially, we need, uh, if we have a cycle in one of these dependency graphs, that basically means that there is uh, no, uh, that, that that particular schedule isn't serializable. So, just to formalize that, uh, a dependency graph has one node for every transaction and one edge, uh, if, uh, one edge from TI to TK, if TK uh, accesses or modifies uh, a, data, a piece of data that was modified by TI. And my claim, and my claim is that a uh, schedule is conflict serializable if uh, this dependency graph has no cycles in it. Is that, are there any questions on this? Yes. Okay, good question. So the question is why uh, why is it possible uh, for there to be uh, uh, for such a dependency to arise? Um, the reason for that is that so in an ideal world you would execute all of your transactions uh, just in one go. On the other hand, that can be potentially inefficient. Sometimes you may actually want to have multiple transactions processing at the same time. Now, there are a couple of different ways that those transactions can interact with the data. Uh, but either the transactions will To simplify things for now, we're going to say that the transactions modify the data in place. So, and we have this uh, schedule here uh, as one potential sequence of operations, one potential way of operating, uh, of evaluating the operations of T1 and T2. And this is just, I mean, this is just one of, of many possible ways of interleaving those operations. Um, but essentially what we want to do is have some uh, precise way of describing when a sequence of operations is invalid. So you, you point out that we, we want to provide users with the illusion that, uh, that their transactions are atomic. I agree completely. Uh, but we, in order to do that, we need to be able to detect uh, when a particular sequence of operations leads us into one of these weird states where um, where that is, is where it's no longer possible to create uh, a sort of serializable schedule. So in this case, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. The situation that the read of your transaction will be dependent on right of way makes it fine. But this this situation that I like read of is dependent on the right of. Well, so think of this in in, in time. Uh, these two transactions are executing independently of one another. You have uh, Bob uh, 
performing some operations on, on as part of transaction one. We have Alice uh, performing some set of operations as part of transaction two. So Bob issues one operation. It does a read, it does a write. Now Bob uh, goes off, grabs a copy. Uh, Alice comes along and starts executing a series of operations. So the, the idea is essentially, uh, so in this case, uh, when I say grabs a coffee, I mean, uh, maybe some Bob needs to do some very expensive computation. But he wants to ensure that his transact, uh, that, that the operation, so essentially the idea is that he, uh, Bob wants to ensure that when he performs this operation, there, uh, no one has come along and uh, created a conflict. And essentially, the, the point is we want to be able to detect when these situations happen, or at the very least, uh, prevent them. Either detect that they have happened, so you can inform Bob, hey, your transaction has failed. Uh, what do you want to do about it? Or prevent it from happening in the first place, in which case uh, Bob would put a lock on A, presumably also put a lock on B, and then Alice would have to wait until Bob finishes. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? So, uh, this is a point. Uh, this is a schedule. It's a round right. This, this schedule is not conflict serializable. It's round right. It is not, well, this is not, uh, I'm not going to use the word correct because correct is, is not, is ill-defined. It is, um, if we define correct to be conflict serializable, then this schedule is not correct. Basically, this schedule is not conflict serializable. And if you think that conflict serializability is, uh, basically, I need to say that there, is, there might be a situation where this is a, uh, a direct thing to do. Uh, but for our purposes, no, it's not. Does that answer your, your question? Yes. OK. Serializability. 
um, we can define something called view serializability. And the idea there is that there, there's sort of this weird intermediate uh, phase of there, there's sort of weird middle bit in the middle of the schedule. And it's entirely possible that one transaction will undo the bad effects of another transaction. So the idea of uh, what's known as view serializability is that you can uh, rearrange the schedule in any way, shape, or form as long as not just the end, uh, as long as the, the uh, final transaction to write a value is the same, and as long as any sort of reads or writes that happen in the middle of the transaction uh, are between the same two pairs of operations. Let me give you a, this works better by example. So if I have three transactions here, uh, transaction one does a read, transaction two, uh, oh, sorry, transaction one does a read, then a write, transaction two does a write, and then transaction three does a write. Now of these three operations, um, the only one that actually has any impact on the final state of A is transaction three. Uh, the order of these two really doesn't matter because whichever way they go, transaction three is still going to overwrite that value. So you can sort of swap those two around and still get the same result. In other words, uh, the right order of those two operations is irrelevant. And so what essentially that means is that these two schedules are, <coughs> are what's known as uh, view serialized. Um, and that's basically just another sort of definition of equivalence. Um, so, um, any questions on view serializability? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah? So, would you be able to get rid of that middle um, You could hypothetically entirely get rid of that middle op. In, in practice, you're not going to have. Uh, the entire transaction masked by another one. Um, but, yeah, in that case, you could just get rid of transaction two. Or even transaction one as well, since it has no impact on the final state. Um, the one, there's a question of side effects. So transactions may have effects not visible inside the database. If that happens, uh, and the general assumption is that uh, they will have side effects. So you can't just arbitrarily get rid of the, the operation, but you can get rid of any effect that they have on the database. OK. All right, so that was a little bit out of order. Uh, but brings me to uh, the next portion of today's lecture, which is this idea of uh, which is how do we actually deal with these blocks. So we've been talking a lot about these, uh, about two-phase locking, and how that can uh, provide conflict serializability and potentially also view serializability. Um, but how do we actually uh, use them? How do we actually uh, get? What sort of nuances uh, come up with the locks themselves? So uh, locks in a typical database system are going to be managed by something called a uh, lock manager. This is often part of uh, the component, uh, the transaction manager. This lock manager is basically going to keep a big table of all objects in the database that can be locked. And for each, uh, each object in the database that can be locked, it's basically going to keep track of the number of transactions currently holding a lock on that particular uh, object, um, whether that lock is shared or exclusive, and in the case that it's exclusive, or other case, it will also keep around a queue of uh, requests for that particular object. Uh, so for example, if there are multiple shared, uh, tra uh, multiple transactions holding a shared lock, then we'll need to queue up any sort of exclusive block requests. Um, now the big challenge of the lock manager, the big thing that it's responsible for, is uh, dealing with uh, deadlock situations. 
In a deadlock situation, it is uh, two transactions that are each waiting uh, for the other transaction uh, to release its locks. And one example of this would be, we swap the order here. So transaction two performs a write on A, so it's going to have to acquire uh, a lock on A. Uh, transaction one wants to perform a write on B, so it's going to have to obtain a lock on B, an exclusive lock. Now transaction uh, one comes along, it wants to do a write on A, so it tries to acquire uh, a lock on A, but it can't because transaction two has already uh, obtained that lock. So it now has to wait. And meanwhile, transaction two wants to get an exclusive lock on B, which it can't because transaction one has it. Now, essentially, there's no, there's no way that these two transactions can proceed. So how do we handle these situations? Well, there are two possibilities. The first um, is to prevent deadlocks uh, just outright. Don't allow uh, the system to get into a deadlock situation. And there's a couple of ways that we're going to talk about towards the end of the class today. Uh, the other possibility is that we can uh, detect deadlocks after the fact. So if you do end up getting into one of those situations, you can sort of uh, analyze, analyze the set of uh, lock requests that are pending and figure out that, hey, there's a deadlock going on. I need to do something about it. So sort of the baseline uh, way that this, uh, the lock manager uh, will handle things is that uh, every time a lock request comes in and it can't be satisfied, either because it's an exclusive request on a shared lock, or it's a shared request on an exclusive lock. Well, it's an exclusive request on any other uh, locked object, or shared request on an exclusive lock. Um, it's going to block the calling transaction, and that transaction is just going to sit there and wait until the resource is available. Uh, the lock manager is also going to keep uh, a, what's known as a waits for graph, uh, where every single node in the graph represents one transaction, and we have an edge in the graph uh, for every uh, transaction that's waiting for another transaction to complete. Uh, so for example, if uh, TK is holding a lock and TI wants to acquire that lock, then we have an edge from TI to TK. And if it ever turns out that there's a cycle in this graph, as in this case, where we have uh, dependency from one, uh, 2 to 1 and dependency from 1 to 2, and that means that there's a deadlock situation. Let me give you a little more involved, uh, a slightly more involved example. I have uh, four transactions here. Um, transaction one wants to do a read, so it acquires a shared block. Transaction two wants to do a write, so it acquires an exclusive block on B. Uh, transaction one wants to do a read on B, so it acquires a shared or tries to acquire a shared block. Can no longer proceed. Transaction three then comes along, acquires a shared lock on C, does a read on C. Uh, transaction B tries to acquire an exclusive lock on C, but can't. Transaction four tries to acquire an exclusive lock on B. And transaction three tries to acquire an exclusive lock on A, which is being held by T1. So let's go through this uh, over the course of time. So we start at transaction one. Uh, everything is happy until transaction one tries to acquire a shared lock on B. At this point, transaction one, uh, now we're going to keep a, a waits for a graph. Transaction one is now waiting for transaction two to release the lock on B. Uh, everything keeps going nicely until T2 tries to acquire a lock on C. Uh, T2 now depends, uh, has a wait, uh, waits for T2 is now waiting for transaction three. Transaction four now tries to acquire an exclusive lock on B. Uh, it can't, so transaction four is now waiting on transaction two. And finally, transaction three tries to acquire an exclusive lock on A. So T3 is now uh, waiting for T1. As you can see, there's a cycle here from T1 to T2 to T3 and back. Uh, so this means that we are in a deadlock situation. Any questions? Yes. 
So once uh, I acquire exclusive uh, uh, in the uh, T2 transaction, mm -hmm. uh, once I acquire the uh, exclusive block on B, and I write B, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, do I have to release the block? No. Uh, so in two-phase locking, as soon as you release one lock, you have to you can no longer acquire new locks. Essentially, you want to uh, hold all of your locks until the transaction ends, uh, and that will uh, that will basically prevent anyone from coming in. And, and uh, essentially, that forces anything that depends on one of these operate uh, on the value of B to uh, be processed entirely after you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Why doesn't B Why doesn't be released? So uh, that was uh, okay. Uh, so basically, the question is, uh, uh, it's the same question. Uh, why why doesn't be release uh, its exclusive block here? Um, because the uh, the reason for that is that we're not waiting for uh, the lock isn't to prevent um, simultaneous modifications to be. The lock is is there to enforce ordering. So the the reason that we're locking this is that we want to force any uh, operation that needs to modify B, any transaction that modifies B, has to execute after transaction 2 finishes, or after transaction 2 is done modifying it, modifying these values. And so we want B, transaction 2 to hold on to the lock all the way until it is, it is done, it's complete, uh, it doesn't need to do anything else. Yes? Um. Uh, T1 has a shared lock on A. So what if T1 again want to write something into it? Does it like release the shared lock and then put an exclusive lock on A? Yes. So um, if A is the only transaction holding onto that lock, then at any point it can upgrade that shared lock into an exclusive lock. Um, if it turns out that another transaction has come along, uh, acquired a shared lock on A. So if T4 were to do, uh, let's say, were to grab a shared lock on A, then after that point, uh, transaction one could no longer upgrade until transaction four finished. So like Uh, 
uh, would require creating a dependency on a, a, a transaction with a lower uh, priority. And if that happens, the transaction with the lower priority gets killed. There are two concrete strategies for doing that. And the first, if you have two transactions, uh, transaction I and transaction K, and tri transaction I tries to obtain a lock on, um, on some object that transaction K already has, then we try and look at TI's priority. If TI has the higher of the two priorities, then it's going to sit there and wait for transaction K to complete. Uh, if transaction I has a lower priority, then it will wait. And the other stra strategy is to uh, flip the two roles. So uh, again, if transaction I has a higher priority, in this case, it's not going to wait for TK. Uh, it's essentially going to force TK to abort. Um, and if it has a lower priority, then TI is going to wait. So essentially, the end result here is that um, well, you have uh, one strategy where um, a read request uh, can cause you to abort, and one strategy where uh, an op uh, where some sort of locking request uh, can, can essentially force the other transaction to abort. Um, one of the, the sort of uh, caveats here is that if you do force one of these transactions to abort, typically what that means is that you're going to re, uh, re-perform that computation, redo all of the, uh, the the computations associated with that transaction, and you want to you don't want to get into a situation where one transaction keeps getting aborted over and over again. So uh, you can sort of protect uh, protect transactions from from uh, suffering that fate. Uh, by uh, allowing them to keep their uh, their timestamp. Uh, sorry, if you assign priority based on the, the time the transaction was submitted, uh, when you restart the transaction, you sort of keep that time around uh, so that the transaction no, uh, doesn't keep getting killed. Um, any questions on this?